Okay, so welcome to Marine Biology. This is going to be our first introductory lecture, uh, going over some introductory stuff. Um, so first off, uh, we'll go over this in class, so I'm just kind of going to skip over it just a little bit about me. This is the textbook and most of the materials, figures, um, and content for the class is going to come from the textbook, uh, including these video lectures. So. Um, some of this material is not original. I didn't think of it myself, but was taken from this uh, textbook. All right, so first off, what is marine biology? Well, we're going to be studying organisms um, which are found in uh, salt water. Okay? Um, and this generally, of course, is the ocean, but also applies to other areas such as Mediterranean Sea, Gulf of Mexico, um, and a few saltwater um, areas such as the Great Salt Lake. Um, so we are ignoring or not looking at then freshwater organisms. All right, oceanographers, um, those who study oceanography are going to study the physical and chemical aspects of the ocean. So we're not looking at living things, but looking at currents, salinity, um, changes in temperature, things like that. And so they are um, related to marine biology. And a lot of marine biology um, requires the information provided by oceanographers. But um, because they're not studying living things, it's not biology. All right, so marine biology is an applied field of biology, right? So biology in general is studying life, and now we're getting a little more concentrated into a specific environment. It requires inputs from, like I said before, oceanography, but also these general sciences such as geology, chemistry, physics, um, meteorolo meteorology, and zoology. And... Um, it seems like everyone at one point in their childhood, um, when you ask them what they wanted to be when they grow up, they said, it, said I wanted to be a marine biologist, um, even though they didn't necessarily know what that meant. So this figure on the, on the side here is how you might become a marine biologist. Um, you would need generally at least a master's or PhD, um, which requires some sort of research and have some sort of specialization into a specific type of marine biology. Uh, most or a lot of marine biologists um, are also involved in scuba diving and so they can go and do studies that way, but not all of them. Uh, many of them monitor other parts of the ocean, such as basic trophic levels like zooplankton and phytoplankton. Um, but there are also lots of other niches for someone with a marine biology degree. You may also be part of a research laboratory or a consulting firm that does assessments on specific ecosystems. Um, now, and generally, to become a marine biologist, you would have to have a marine biology program, which we don't have at Southern Virginia University. But we're still <coughs> um, going to provide you an experience um, within this course, which would um, uh, approximate some of the things that a marine biologist might do. <laughs> so why study marine biology? And I think this is what is lacking um, from most people's uh, childhood dreams. Become a marine biologist is, you know, why? They just think, oh, well, sounds like a cool profession. But uh, some of the reasons why marine biology is so interesting and fundamental to biology is, uh, first, life. The first living organisms are um, proposed to have come from the ocean, from the sea. There's a lot of human benefits that we get from the ocean, the marine environment, including uh, medicines, food products, recreation and tourism, oxygen production, um, and uh, climate control. Uh, the ocean is a, a big buffer to temperature shifts in the world. Uh, marine organisms also impact human life and their property. So some power plants use marine water. There are also desalinization plants, which get fresh water from salt water. Um, microorganisms found in the ocean can also cause human infections. 
So there are some direct interactions between humans and um, the marine environment. Why you are studying marine biology or why you are taking this course um, may be to fulfill a requirement, um, an elective of some sort. Um, but I hope that you also have a desire, an honest desire, to learn something about marine biology and some of the interesting life forms. Um, it, the marine, marine biology, I think, is a very interesting area of study because the marine environment is so foreign to what we experience as humans on the terrestrial um, ecosystems which we live. Um, so this is blank because, you know, your reasons for taking this class may be um, varying and specific. But I hope through all of it, it's a lot of fun. All right, so some fundamentals then, kind of even going back. Um, marine biology is a science, right? And so one of the questions I like to ask in class is, well, what is science? If you were to define science, what would you um, say to your friend who, let's say, isn't a scientist? Not that everyone here is a scientist, but everyone has an idea of what science is. So my definition, and the one I, I, I think you should learn, is the formulation and or discrediting of objective explanations for the observations and phenomena of the physical and biological universe. So um, we use tools, instruments, and our own senses to measure specific things in the environment as they relate to life, um, as they relate to um, the movement and uh, structure of physical and chemical things. Um, we derive certain theories and then we test those theories. So generally, and these are from dictionary.com different um, definitions, but generally they all have this element of a process in which you are trying to find patterns in how things work. Um, and that involves the uh, scientific method. All right, so now there is some fundamental ways in which science has to be um, pursued. And that is first through the gathering of our observations, okay? And we rely, of course, on our physical senses and we, a fundamental to that is that our physical senses are a reality. What we perceive is, um, is what's really going on, okay? As opposed to, let's say, what you imagine isn't necessarily um, reality. Um, so we have these observations and then we use logic and there are two types of reasoning. There's that, that's fundamental, of course, to science. First is deductive reasoning, where you apply general pr principles to specific results. So that is an example of that would be, if you've ever watched any sort of Sherlock Holmes show or movie, that's what he does. He makes general um, assumptions about human behavior and then is able to predict specific things um, based on those generalizations. All right, and then the other one is inductive reasoning, where you can make um, uh, theories and laws or specific observations through measurements. So, so an example of this would be Sir Isaac Newton, who measured how things fall, how things move, and came up with these laws of um, you know movement. And he applies those universally. So everything, uh, his equations that he came up with apply to everything that move um, within the world um, or you know he didn't his laws don't apply to cosmic motion but they do to things here on earth as they are affected by gravity okay so that would be inductive reasoning all right um, so with our observations we may also know that specific things um, affect specific outcomes um, and those are we can call factors or variables that have um, an influence on the outcome of an observation okay now within a an experiment we can look and test these different variables and we can also set up a control um, which would be uh, an experiment done with known results so I know what is going to happen 
within this specific type of condition that I'm going to run. And then I can change different variables. And any change in the outcome, I can refer to or point to those variables that I change. So an example here, um, field observations, where you have lots of variables such as the type of muscle, temperature, food, water, quality, disease, unknown factors. All these are going into the specific type of you know, growth of these muscles. And what I can do is look, if all everything else is the same, and just look at the difference in temperature, and then um, determine, you know, what the growth is of these two species, I can attribute that, or at least have a theory that, oh, temperature affects the growth of this species. Um, I can replicate that same, uh, you know, this would be a natural experiment or natural observation. I can replicate that same thing within a laboratory and actually grow and specifically control things in a more controlled environment. Um, and then I can add even more evidence to the theory that temperature affects how these this species grows. Okay, and so <clears throat> there's different types of experiments, but generally you have one variable being um, in the most simplest form, one variable being changed, the rest kept constant, and the outcome can then be determined by that variable which you changed. So then that is essentially the basics of the scientific uh, method, um, which isn't quite as uh, simple as the step-by-step -step process you may have learned um, in elementary or middle school. Um, but the, the, the structure of it is, is the same. <coughs> so first you need to gather information, you form a hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, and you form conclusions from your test. Um, and those conclusions um, are generally that you have evidence for or against a hypothesis. And you don't really ever prove that something is true, not through one test, right? Um, Vital to that also is this idea of repeating your experiment and having the same results over and over. So repetition and validation, and then also um, review uh, from other people from outside sources to expose maybe biases or other things that may be in there. So um, the results of your experiment and multiple experiments may have you revise your hypothesis, may have you um, reject it altogether. Um, and may also provide new questions that you would then pr have new tests for. And so the scientific method is a lot more messy in the middle with our, our forming of hypotheses, our um, results, and our conclusions. And that really um, structurally changes over time. But through um, multiple different experiments which are uh, similar, you can come to a conclusion that generally figures out how things work, right? And that's kind of the purpose of the scientific method. Now there are a lot of weaknesses, right? This isn't the golden ticket to find all truth in the universe. Um, and, and some of those weaknesses might be bias in the observer. You may want a specific result because of you know your job or whatever. There's always going to be human error in measurement, in, in interpretation. Um, and there may also be confounding factors, factors that are were not considered in the um, test but are affecting the results. Now with the scientific method, again, you can't really prove that things are true. You can kind of, you can prove or provide evidence that things are false. Um, but generally we talk in ways that evidence supports or evidence does not support this specific theory. The scientific method is slow. It takes a lot of time. Um, it takes repetition and specifics in order to get to a specific answer. Experiments often have more questions than they do answers. And there are also ethical considerations in what you can and can't do with the scientific method. Uh, there's also funding issues so um, and practicality issues. So there may be very interesting, important things, um, 
experiments that need to be done, but because of funding, they are never done. And finally, um, the once scientific um, studies are published, they can often be misreported or um, altered in ways which they provide misinformation. But despite all these weaknesses, it if done in the correct way, it can provide many answers and improve well-being of humans and um, ecosystems alike. Okay, so there are different types of studies. Like I said, not all studies um, involve such clean um, tests. Um, and some <clears throat> studies just um, increase our you know, knowledge or, or our gathering of data. So for example, here's somebody observing the um, nesting behavior of a puffin. There's no real experiment going on here, just kind of going through and seeing how this organism behaves and uh, taking note of what it does. So that'd be an observational study. Um, we talked a little about controlled laboratory experiments. So you may have a rat in which you have two um, or two different groups of rats. They are um, kept under the exact same conditions except one is manipulated and one is kept the same. So here this would be our control and this would be our test, right? Uh, we have correlational studies. So these may, and, and these types of studies aren't necessarily just one thing. So you may have an observational correlational study. So here's one in which data was gathered, which showed per capita daily meat consumption and the incidence of colon, can colon cancer in women. Now, correlation does not mean causation, but um, many times a correlational study is significant in its what it finds. So here, this probably has some significance to it. The amount of meat you eat um, may increase your amount uh, or increase the risk you have for colon cancer. But we can't definitively say that. We can just say that this correlational evidence um, supports that theory. Uh, we would need to do more tests in order to see how that um, rings true over time. We also have quasi-experimental studies. So studies where you may not be able to control everything. So maybe studies done in the field where it, it could be set up to where you are looking at specific variables, and, but there are many other confounding factors which you aren't controlling for, which also could affect it. So it is, um, we'll give some examples of this in class, but um, the idea is you are trying to run an experiment, but in such a large scale or in the field where you can't really make it fully controlled. And finally, you have opportunistic studies. So there are events which happen in nature in which you could take advantage of. So here, for example, is a lava field, and you may be studying how plants and animals recolonize the area after uh, the lava has cooled. This is just an opportunistic thing. Uh, you can't control how much lava goes out. You can't um, control any of the variables, but because it happened, you can then go in and observe and make um, an observational study about it. All right, so... <clears throat> <clears throat> Once something has been tested rigorously over time, um, you can call it a theory. Okay, in theory, a theory in science it means an explanation supported by facts, observations, and patterns. So something that has taken a long time to get to this point. Um, in common language, however, it means like a guess. Oh, when someone says, "Oh, I have a theory," usually you know they don't have a lot they're going off of. But in science. Um, it's a term that means a lot more. And so when people say it's just a theory, well, in science that means actually quite a bit. In, um, in common day language, it means something different. So some examples of theory which have a lot of evidence for them are Newtonian physics, including you know the observations and behavior of objects being subject to gravity, the theory of evolution, germ theory, cell theory, endosymbiotic theory, right? All of these are, um, Theories which have lots of evidence and, and are basically taken as fact for the time being. Okay, so um, 
<clears throat> Excuse me. So the science of biology is something we will be experiencing in this marine biology class, um, including uh, research and discovery, which is what we're going to talk about in lecture and discussions in uh, the different ecosystems and uh, parts of the marine environment that which affect life. We're also going to experience a field trip in which we'll be able to see this, you know, firsthand. Uh, the scientific method. So we're not going to be too, doing too many experiments in class, but there is a project in which we will um, be conducting experiments on the field trip. Techniques. We're going to learn about techniques. We'll have some opportunities to maybe do some dissections and some other things in class and of course on the field trip as well. We'll talk about the principles of biology um, and we'll talk about some major theories, especially the uh, theory of evolution. Um, and, and really everything in biology is makes more sense when seen under the lens of evolution. So we'll talk more about evolution and if you have questions and, and um, about where this fits with your faith, we can, we can spend some time on that as well. Uh, evolution includes the natural history of a species, um, including, you know, its, uh, its evolution over time and the taxonomy or where it um, fits um, related to other species. Uh, we will have, we'll talk about a lot of invertebrates and vertebrates, so animals and also um, other organisms within the sea. And we'll talk about lots of different levels of organization. We won't go too much into atomic chemistry, um, but we will um, talk about you know cells and uh, tissues and um, organisms on up to the ecology or marine ecology of how the living and non-living um, environment affects each other. Now our Field trip will be at Horn Point. There is an environmental science education center there. Um, this is the flyer that they gave me. Um, it has a laboratory inside with lots of scientific equipment, which will um, provide us opportunities to then go and take samples um, and run some simple experiments. Uh, within the um, they have a little bay here and there's many, I'm sure, wetland areas. Now, I haven't actually been here, so we'll kind of be experiencing this for the first time together. But um, I hear it's a great research facility. It has a lot of things in which we can use. It should be a lot of fun. Okay, so that's kind of our introductory, what we're going to do in this class, a little bit of the fundamentals of biology. Um, this next little part we'll talk about really the history of marine biology. So marine biology may go back to really prehistoric times um, where people use things from the marine environment to uh, better their life, um, better their ability to you know, hunt and gather food. So some stone blades um, and clamshells made from marine environment materials have been dated as far back as 165,000 years old. Um, there's also 110,000 year old shell harpoons and fish hooks which have been find, found. So there was some observation in prehistoric man in which they were able to use things from the marine environment. So in its simplest form they had some sort of study of marine biology, right? Now the marine environment you know, and the sea itself was first kind of explored and discovered um, historically in civilizations such as the Pacific Islanders and Phoenicians. So the Pacific Islanders, of course, had lots of knowledge about the ocean as they lived in um, small islands in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the Phoenicians also extensively explored the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, Black Sea, Indian Ocean, Eastern Atlantic Ocean. So, um, their knowledge of the sea um, historically started there. Ancient Greeks also had an extensive knowledge of the Mediterranean Sea, and Aristotle was kind of the first one who started to describe marine life forms and their features and document those descriptions. 
During the Dark Ages, most exploration took a step back of the marine environment. However, um, the Vikings in the 9th and 10th centuries uh, began many exploration, explorations and, in fact, Leif Erikson, one of the Vikings, um, discovered, so to speak, uh, much of northern Canada as he sailed from Iceland to Greenland to um, areas within northern Canada. However, he didn't settle there and, uh, you know, it didn't start the the same colonization as Columbus voyage did. The Renaissance, the Renaissance of discovery um, and art and other um, scientific pursuits also led to uh, a continual exploration of the marine environment, including sailing uh, and discovering the New World by Columbus. Again, discovering it and uh, expeditions around the world. So Magellan was the first one to sail around the world. As he did so, he took note and stopped many different areas. Um, this began, um, or was part of, a colonization of many areas of the world by European countries. James Cook um, was an English um, explorer who was one of the first to bring a naturalist or someone to document the biology of the areas that they went. Um, and this began a, uh, a habit which many other explorers started to do afterwards. They would bring on a scientist um, in order to you know, document different things and bring things back to study them. Um, James Cook, so he sailed all the oceans. He was the first European to view the Arctic ice fields, Hawaii, Tahiti, and many other Pacific islands. So these are some of the um, travels which he took. And he did extensive mapping and brought home lots of different um, specimens. So one of these naturalists um, uh, included in the 1800s uh, Charles Darwin, who took a ride with um, on, on a ship called the HMS Beagle from 1831 to 1836. This um, voyage was very influential in his um, uh, development of the theory of evolution via natural selection. So he, uh, especially his observations on the Galapagos with finches and um, also geology and and other things. He also, uh, within his uh, book on the theory of natural selection, commented about baleen whales and um, did some experiments with barnacles. Um, so he was also very involved in or did a few experiments about um, using marine specimens. So was a bit of a marine biologist himself. Now that theory of evolution, of course, like I mentioned before, is very important to the understanding of biology today. All right, Edward Forbes uh, was one of the first to start studying the sea floor. So at this point, all observations had really been just been, been made on the shores and along the, the, the surface of the ocean. But he started studying the seafloor around the British Isles um, in the 1840s and 1850s and started to come up with these different zones or different areas, um, which um, he could attribute specific characteristics to. So you had your continental shelf, which then led to a slope um, and then to the sea floor. And um, we'll talk about the different zones later in the different organisms types of biology you can find in each of them later. All right, Charles Wilville Thompson in the late 1800s uh, led the Challenger expedition. And this is the first major exploration where they didn't just have a naturalist on board, but the whole thing was just to study marine organisms. And he did enough, and again, this was he was kind of a pioneer here, really, in marine biology, but he had enough organisms and enough uh, extensive, detailed um, observations to publish 50 volumes of information that he collected just in this one trip over the next 19 years. So just tons and tons of fundamental information which came from this trip and began uh, the, a general... A practice of going out finding marine organisms 
and, and doing scientific studies in the marine environment. Today, we, in modern marine biology, we have a lot of different tools which allow the exploration um, in much more detail than in these uh, kind of fundamental voyages where they just kind of collected specimens. So we have um, marine biology research stations. These are generally coastal, um, which have you know a lot of these really high-tech equipment in order to um, you know go in and make observations of the marine biological world. In the United States, we have lots of facilities, um, including Woods Hole Marine Biology in Massachusetts, Scripps Institute in La Jolla, California. Uh, Friday Harbor Labs in Washington, and one in which we will be visiting very close to the Horn Point Laboratory Research Station in Maryland. This is just a very small list. There's actually uh, a lot uh, of different marine stations up and down the east and west coast, generally run by universities, um, and they even have you know a staff of universities which work from these stations and do research from there constantly. Some important tools of the trade in modern marine biology are remote sensing. Remote sensing, so that is really using satellite and um, aerial data to view large parts of the ocean and and um, be able to infer types of oceanic life, depending on those images. Sonar, which uses um, you know sound waves to detect specific um, structures with on the on the seafloor, scuba diving, like I mentioned before, so actually going in with tanks of air and physically observing um, areas, and also going you know you can set plots, you can set up substrate, you can do um, direct observations through scuba, um, and then remotely operated vehicles or um, these can be manned and unmanned where you can actually go underneath in the ocean very deep depths so that's one of the problems with scuba diving you can only go so far under the ocean you can only be there for so long these remotely operated vehicles can go there for much longer and can go much deeper um, and we'll watch some of these videos uh, of some discoveries that they've made in there um, also, we have research vessels, so uh, similar to what was done historically, only much more high-tech, you have vessels which go out and just collect um, data for marine biology experiments. Some very cool things um, uh, include an underwater research station called Aquarius. So this is off the coast of Florida. It's actually a place 60 feet under the water where you can go and live, kind of like you would um, in a motorhome, such a small research facility, um, but you are living under the water. Now there are some pressure and some other things, um, so people actually can't live there for indefinitely. You have to go up to the surface, surface to allow your body to decompress from the pressure, but um, you can spend periods of time directly underneath the ocean and go out in scuba gear and other gear and observe um, what's happening at the ocean floor. So kind of a cool experience. It'd, it'd be fun to go um, and do something like that. All right, so then this is a figure from your book kind of showing lots of different ways in which you can uh, study parts of the marine environment. Um, and we will you know, touch on some of these as we talk about the different uh, environments and um, and vertebrates and invertebrates and other things, other life within the ocean. So one cool type of vessel as well that can be used is this weird boat where you can sh you can change where the weight of um, the boat is. So you can go out like this, and then you can change to where all the boat ch um, flows to the bottom, and then it causes it to tip. And so you have this. Um, structure in which again people can kind of live and you kind of float around in the ocean until you know and collect your data and whatever and then switch back to this form and go in um, in port all right so that's it for our introductory and history 
Marine Biology first video lecture.